Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever the time of day, thanks for joining us here on A Word With Adam. I'm your host, Adam Gerard, and as you can see behind me, I'm here at stunning Christie's Beach. That's because this is one of the favorite places of this week's guest. She's been elected member of the Labor Party here in South Australia since 2014. She's passionate about advocating equality and bringing voices to the marginalized. She is the member for Renault. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Katrine Hildyard. My guest today is the winner of the 2012 Australia Day Award entitled Women Hold Up Half the Sky. She's also the South Australian Shadow Minister for the Arts, Child Protection, Sports Recreation and Racing, the Status of Women and Domestic Violent Protection. Please welcome Katrine Hildyard. Hello, it's Hi, lovely Katrine. to be here with you. It is, and thank you. We're here in uh, Christie's Beach right now. Yep. Um, I know this is one of the places you're very passionate about because obviously you're the member for Rennell as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, this place is just absolutely magnificent. Obviously, it's beautiful. Also, the people here in our community are just absolutely wonderful. They're kind, connected, resilient, look after each other, amazing. The first question I had for you uh, today is, you've obviously led a life very dedicated to activism and politics. What initially lit that fire in you to, to ignite that spark? Yeah, great, great question. Um, a lot of people will ask me why I went into politics or sometimes I say, why on earth would you ever <laughs> go into politics? And um, the answer for me goes right back to my early childhood. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a household where there was um, a lot of violence and alcoholism and where there was absolutely no money. Mm -hmm. And I learned from a pretty early age that the world doesn't sort of automatically equally <laughs> distribute resources sadly. So from that point in time I developed what I call my relentless passion for fairness yep. and I got taught by my very strong, very fabulous, very loud mum um, that no matter what was happening for us to always look outwards into the community to see what was happening for other people to see how we could give them a hand and uh, my brother and my two sisters and I were very active in the community through surf life saving, mm -hmm. sport, music, drama, community organisations, our church, all sorts of um, activities. Mm -hmm. And by being active in our community, I found that when we work together as a community, wherever you find that community, that we have, um, I think, the best chance of making the world a fairer place, of Absolutely. making sure everyone's included, making sure people have that sense of belonging. And I also learned that, again, wherever you find a community, that there are amazing community leaders there to look after people, to include them as part of a community family. Mm -hmm. And that um, sense of belonging to a community family with other people, when things didn't feel particularly safe or um, when they just felt particularly difficult, to have that broader community family sense was really important to me. So that idea of wanting to work together with others to make the world a better, fairer place has always stayed with me. Um, I think my mum also taught me, and I could tell you many stories about this, um, the value of speaking up when mm -hmm. things weren't fair. And again, through many ridiculous stories, I could um, tell you about watching my mum speak up when things weren't fair for her and for us. Um, also, during my, um, I guess, working life and not being treated particularly fair, fairly, um, I didn't go to university straight away. I went and did all sorts of um, jobs and didn't always get treated the way that I should. And I learned to speak up for myself and for other people. But it was through um, the union movement and the community yeah. sector that I absolutely learned that value of enabling other people's voices. So the reason I went into Parliament is because of that burning passion for fairness and mm -hmm. equality and for people to feel like they belong. Also, so that I could empower and grow other people's collective voice on what's really important to them. Yeah, and I am particularly passionate about um, making sure that the voices of those who most need to be heard, who are sometimes the ones whose voices go unheard, are actually heard. 
So I love that I get to work with people on what's important to them and to, um, yeah, empower their voice on those issues. It's Absolutely. amazing. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that's what I get to rewarding. do as a member of parliament, which is incredible. Absolutely, it's a privilege. Yeah. When you first got elected to parliament, it was 2014, wasn't it? The yes. Round. What, was, what were the feelings going through you, I guess, the... The night before the day of the, you know, the election count and the voting and all that, what, what kind of adrenaline rush was that like? <laughs> um, it's quite um, nerve-wracking because it's, it's, sure. it's like vocational. It's what you want to do. It's part of who you are. And so it's, you put everything into it, I guess. Um, so we, there were a lot of feelings at that time. Um, also, I think any parliamentarian that you talk to, um, when you go through that intense period. I mean, I'm always out and about doing things, <laughs> yeah, but you course. do go through this um, period where you are literally out day, mm -hmm. night, every day, every night. Uh, generally, the few nights before the election, you hardly sleep at all. So you sure. are in this state, I guess. Um, so I guess to sum it up, feeling deeply passionate about wanting to empower people, mm -hmm. wanting to serve them. Um, also, slightly, what's the best word, a little bit out of control by yep. the time you actually get to that day. But also, I guess, as the day wears on, as the night wears on, allowing yourself to get a little bit excited mm -hmm. as well. I remember also, though, feeling this sense of, I don't want to let anyone down. Like of course. I'd, as I always do, been talking with so many people and also been working very closely with people in our team. And I, I did have this sense of responsibility, not wanting to ever let anyone down Absolutely. as well yeah and so what was it like then when you when the announcement came through you know you, it's your seat you've got an elected you've won what what did that feel like really emotional I'm sure but yeah. really really just deeply um deeply grateful to people for putting their faith in me mm -hmm. um and really excited and I think it was one of those moments, you know, there are the people that you love all around sure. you and the people that you want to serve. And, but yeah, when you first hear that, it's a little bit <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. unreal at first. And I think, you know, some people go into politics and perhaps they have a history in their family or they come from a particular place. And, mm -hmm. you know, there is a sense sometimes of entitlement, whereas I would never have dreamed that I could do something like this. So it was, truly like oh my gosh this is <laughs> really happening yeah. so amazing yeah i bet did you sleep that night was it one of the best no. sleeps you've ever no no <laughs> no not at all not at all and it took me i think it took me a few days before it really sunk in and i i remember the first day in parliament just looking around in the parliament just going oh my gosh like yeah, um, it's a pretty powerful yeah, room, isn't it? When yes, you feel like you know, yeah. I mean, I've never sat in the chairs. Obviously, yeah. I've sit in the room on, on school yeah. excursions, and yeah, it's yeah. you can feel the the history of what's happened yeah. in Parliament. So I can imagine yeah. the the overwhelming feeling that now you're in the annals of that yourself is yeah. going to be great. Yeah. As the current Shadow Arts Minister, um, I know the arts can be quite a tricky bag to kind of handle in that there's so much thrown into it with theatre, music, performance, yeah. film, TV. I guess, what are the biggest challenges that you've faced and what do you see the next decade for the arts kind of shaping up like? I think you probably share this view, if I'm <laughs> correct. I think um, arts and artists, whatever particular genre, um, provide us as a community with this amazing vehicle to reflect, to challenge us, to excite us sometimes to make us cry and deeply move us. They play such a fundamental role in our community, both in terms of the way they enable people to participate and express themselves and their creativity, but also in terms of their ability to hold a mirror up to yeah. who we are and what we value and what we should prioritise. Of course, it's also, the arts are also an industry. And mm -hmm. I think that we need to make sure that we value the ecosystem of the arts itself for yes. what it promotes and that we value it as an industry, if that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And because it's an industry also though, you know, the arts, as you would all know, <laughs> are notorious for insecure work. And um, I think we, we should be striving to enable artists to live well yeah. and to um, have more secure employment etc and I also think so I think that is a challenge for us 
I also think though that the challenge and the opportunity is that we make sure South Australia responds and enables every genre, every size company, whether it's you know Absolutely, yeah. the three or four person company as well as the bigger end of town that we actually enable all of those in that arts ecosystem to thrive. Yeah. And I think that comes from, I hope this is making sense, but it comes from valuing the place that arts has. Yes and also valuing it as an industry yes. and making sure that we value every part of that ecosystem, yeah. every I, part I of that industry. I think you hit the nail on the head as well of what, what, how it's part of the ecosystem, especially in times you know, where there's lockdowns and things like yeah. that. I mean, I, I would love to have shares in Netflix right now. I can only imagine how much money Netflix yeah. made during lockdown just from yeah. the amount of people that were subbing. So yeah, the, the, uh, I think you're right. It is, it's something that the culture is integrating there. It's just that perhaps sometimes yeah. the support doesn't yeah. reach it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I think we, we need to think again about the value of every aspect of the arts and um, understand what it does and value what it does for, with and for our community mm. and not be afraid to really support arts that actually challenge us and challenge our way of thinking. I know First Nation Australians, their, their story, their legacy, the, their rights are also very, very important to you. How did that become such a big part of your life? Well, we're sitting here in beautiful Ghana land, yep, always was are. and yes, always, always will be. be. And I pay my respects to elders, past, present and future, and particularly to our local Ghana leaders mm -hmm. who just are so generous with their wisdom Absolutely. and helping us to better understand. Um, I could never, ever, ever, you know, say that I have any understanding of um, how difficult some of the issues are that our Aboriginal community faces. What I can say is that um, I am driven by that passion for fairness mm -hmm. that I spoke about and I am constantly dismayed by the fact that, you know, we are so blessed that we all are enabled to live and work and play on Ghana land or whichever land you happen to be on and that we, you know, here, here there is the oldest continuous Absolutely. living culture in the world, then I am dismayed at what we have done and feel deeply sorry about that and just so many of the injustices and disparity in outcomes just make me so sad and I, again, going back to that passion I have for fairness we just it just has to be better like yeah. it's just not okay and I know mental health services um, and domestic violence obviously have been yeah. big big hot button topics for you what, what's your feeling on, on the state of how both mental health is going at the moment and in particularly how South Australia responds to domestic violence and are there yeah. are there changes for the better that we need to make do you think or? yeah so I think um, my passion around mental health comes from the fact that um, like many families, my family's been deeply impacted by mental health and um, particularly my youngest sister. Um, she has had schizophrenia since she was 15. So for the past three decades, she had three plus decades, she's been dealing with that and probably the first maybe eight, 10 years of her having that illness, she was in and out of um, psychiatric wards in Jeez. public hospitals and she's incredible. She's yeah, like sure. the bravest person, just, she is amazing. Bravest, kindest person I know, like hands down, like incredible. I think that we've come a long way as a community in terms of, you know, there's all sorts of organisations now who do wonderful work talking, about, you know, encouraging people to talk about mental health, etc. I don't think though there has been that progress in terms of, um, reducing stigma around serious yeah, mental illness. I think agree. it is still not understood. Yes. I still think that people it's sometimes flippantly, ways, yeah, flippantly say things without <coughs> understanding what that means for people. Yeah. It's been really difficult for many people with that severe mental illness to access the NDIS mm. and to have the supports in with the flexibility that they need because of the way that their particular illness may to wait. Yep, um, so I think we stu still do have a really, really 
long way to go in that regard. As I said, I applaud all of the mental health organisations and workers who do amazing work raising awareness. And I really also am very grateful to people who work in community mental health mm -hmm. with um, people with chronic mental illness. But there is still stigma. I don't think there are enough resources to support people to live um, safely and well yes. in the community. You know, if you're for many people, and <clears throat> it seems, and it certainly seems that, that has been the case sometimes for my, for my sister. You know, the choice is an emergency department and waiting, or you know, us as a family trying to um, cope with a range of issues. Of and a lot of that has fallen to my mum. But that's such a huge thing for parents, carers who often have um, cared for people for a very long time. And if the choice is emergency presentation where you're waiting, becoming yeah, exactly, more ill, yeah. families trying to cope. I just think there needs to be much more to support people, as I said, to live safely and live well Absolutely. in the community. And also, if we can improve community understanding, I think there will be much better opportunities for people to do that. Are you finding that there's a, a correlation or a link between the, the problems that we're seeing in the mental health service and perhaps some of the domestic violence that we're factoring as well, do you think they're two completely separate well, issues? Well, I think that, um, you know, we have a domestic violence crisis yeah. in Australia, including here in South Australia. Um, yeah, absolutely. We know the absolutely shocking statistics. None of them are getting better. Mm -hmm. um, we fail to address the gender inequality that lies at, as the root cause of disrespect and violence towards women. Absolutely. We have failed to... Um, uh, provide pr funding for prevention and early intervention in the way that we should. We have this um, fantastic group of workers who work in crisis mm -hmm. services. So when a woman is in immediate physical danger, so for instance, if someone comes into my office, if they're in immediate physical danger, we know exactly what to do. We yeah, can connect them with police, we can connect them with those emergency crisis accommodation supports. but. If a woman comes and you know she's expressing things where I, we kind of go, okay, things are not going yeah. to a good place. We need some uh, prevention, some prevention services with therapy and counselling and those sort of things. That doesn't exist. Yeah. It certainly doesn't exist here in the south. So one of the things we've been campaigning on in the south got a campaign called Southern Women Matter mm -hmm. and we just presented a petition to Parliament from 3,300 plus people wow. to say we absolutely need a funded prevention hub here Abs in the yeah, South. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, to go back to your question about mental health and domestic violence, I think um, you know domestic violence sadly occurs in households where there has been no presentation of mental health issues that occurs in every suburb, in every yeah. region, in families that have been here for decades, families that arrived last week, it's, it's everywhere. So I don't think there's necessarily, um, you know, this automatic connection, but of course, in families where there is um, domestic violence, of course there is an impact yeah, on exactly. people's mental health. Of course there is. So you've been the, the member for Randall since 2014. What are some of the, the highlight projects or the best moments that you've had during your time in office? I think the things that most stick out are those moments. You know, I spoke to you before about being passionate about bringing people together and ensuring people's voice is heard. Those moments, whatever the scale of the issue is, when you can actually enable that and facilitate that and you see someone that you've encouraged to speak up about something, you know, speaking in front of a whole lot of people and leading the way on a campaign, whatever Absolutely. the particular issue is, that is always the best moment. It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, mean, that, I guess that's the other thing too is that there are so many success stories in this area as well. Yeah. There's just so many people that you can look and be like, man, I helped all these people. And yeah. like, you know, I almost feel like when you drive down Beach Road, particularly, you know, there, there are so many businesses now that are there that weren't there, you know, five, yeah. six years ago. And they, you know, they've stayed the course through COVID. They're still going. Yeah. And I think that's, that's testament to what you're talking about, that, yeah. you know, that passion that the area has and what you've kind of given back to help yeah. them thrive. So yeah, that's and yeah. enable people's voices. And I think, so it's those 
big things or people yeah. who do help people to get together and, and speak up and progress change. I'm talking a very local level, yeah, but also there will just be moments like, you know, you might be door knocking and you visit someone and have a chat and just find out how they're going and maybe you're the only person that's visited in a while and you've had a lovely conversation and, yeah, exactly, you know, yeah. it's been a really good time with that person I think those things are also just really rewarding of course yeah. then of course there are other things that happen in Parliament when you pass a particular law or you know there's a particular debate or all of those things you get to represent your community's Absolutely, view but yeah. always yeah at the heart of it is when you can see that people have had an opportunity to speak up, have their voices heard and make change. Obviously, as we just talked about, you're very active in this southern area here. What are some of the, the gem businesses, the hidden gems that people might not know about, or some of your favourite places to go, maybe just to grab a coffee or something like that? What are yeah. what are the highlight areas you would say for? Oh my gosh, there's so many. <laughs> well, we are here. Yeah, absolutely, beautiful, yes. um, beautiful Christie's Beach, which is just absolutely stunning. Stunning. Agreed. Um, as is our whole mid coast. Um, there are so many places. I'm feeling worried. I'm going to leave someone out. <laughs> One of the um, activities that I'm constantly encouraging people to do is park run. Yep. So park run, um, we got going here at Christie's about five years ago, and our former government provided some funds to help get it going. But um, it's a whole movement of people around the world. What happens here at Christie's is that there are people of every ability, every age, every background who gather at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. every Saturday morning and you can traverse the five kilometres however um, you can. The great thing about our park run here at Christie's, as I said, there's such diversity of people that come, but also um, it is literally the most encouraging physical activity <laughs> ever. It's yeah, incredible. Absolutely. And one of the things that's just um, started is a number of volunteers at our park run here have been trained by an organisation called Blind, the Blind Sports Association. Yep. And so now here at our park run, people who are vision impaired can actually come and somebody will buddy run with them and almost be their navigator, that's which awesome. is just fantastic. And yeah. I think it's, um, it's a symbol of how inclusive yeah, our absolutely. community is. It's just brilliant. But there are, oh my gosh, I'm like, I'm going, which one do I talk about? Because there are so, so many here, Ripple and Swirl, which is amazing. There are a number of new places that have just opened up on Beach Road. Yep. Um, one of them is District B. young woman in our community has just opened up, which is effectively a small bar and tapas food. She's Excellent. going beautifully. Angelo, who moved over here from Rome a few years ago, has opened uh, Trattoria de Roma on <laughs> Beach Road. Which has amazing Italian food and he is packed every single night. Awesome. Recently, we went and chatted on a Friday night to people at every hotel. They're That'd all fantastic. Awesome, yeah. All of those hotels have great food. One in particular is the Lonsdale Hotel, if you haven't yep, absolutely eaten there. Agree. Yep, yep. That's got really, really good food. Um, also, in our community, there's this huge network of sporting clubs who are often open mm -hmm. on Friday nights, different times um, during the week and are always welcoming people in, um, but everywhere. I get all my <laughs> gifts. Every time I need to buy a gift, I get them at one of the places in Port Nalunga. Um, it's heaps of great places at Southgate. I could go on <laughs> and on and on. It's all fantastic. My final question has to do with, um, funnily enough, Pride down the yeah. South, uh, literally with yeah. Pride of the South. Um, obviously, you were at the last Pride of the South March. We were there filming it yeah. as well. Um, events like that, I feel, are uh, fundamental game changes. Why do you think they're so important to the area and how how can we even see those grow a little bit more than what they have already? So I remember um, when Shane from Pride of the South um, first came into my office and I met her and she spoke with me about how she was feeling about particular things and I'd happened to have a couple of conversations with other people about the same thing. So I said to each of them, let's get together and talk about what yeah. we could do and we had a number of conversations and from there Pride of the South was born. And 
It has been absolutely incredible to see this group of community leaders in the outer southern suburbs um, absolutely find their voices and do so in a way that is always about enabling other people to find their voices. Absolutely. Like um, Pride of the South is amazing because it, it's never sought to be some huge structured incorporated association constantly it's sought to collaborate with others and to focus on issues that are important to people and from there it's it's grown and it provides benefits to people in terms of lgbtiqa plus community members um seeing that there's that place for them they're welcome here in our community they're included in our community they're they're embraced by the community that's what i saw like is absolutely there was just nothing but love and positivity the whole way down beach road it was great and in turn our community is absolutely backing them in and we are shifting attitudes along the way i remember when we had the south says yes campaign you know, we were, when I say we, Pride of the South members and I supported them, others supported them. We were standing outside Coles and just as people came out, just chatting with them about their views. It's remark- always remarkable and it's what I always believe is the best way to really find out what's important to people. What could shift just from having that one-on-one yeah. conversation. Yes, yeah, power of community, isn't it? Yeah, it is a group that strengthened our whole community. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking of the community, like I'm proud to be part of your community and you know, I, I'm wishing nothing but the best of luck. I know we've got an election in the sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. You've, you've got my vote hands down. And thank I, you. I can pretty much speak for the rest of the crew as well. Thank so, you. Um, thank you for everything you've done for us and thank you for being a guest here today. Thank you. Can I just say yes. thank you to you for what you and your crew are doing. I, um, I think that just talking with people and telling people stories is incredibly powerful so all power to you and thank you for your interest and for your commitment to our community as well I know you have also supported different events and initiatives and that is very generous and it makes a difference so thank thank you thank you this has been a Cabana production